How is everyone today? Good. It's great to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming out in that white stuff. Just one more time, right? That's just it. That's what we hope. Anyway, good morning. My name is Chris Jester. I work here at Grace. I'm the Connections Director, and it is fantastic to be with all of you today. If you're new, I want to say a great big special welcome to each of you. Thank you for being here. We are so glad you would come and check things out at Grace. If you didn't know, there is an amazing program for kids and youth happening at the other end of the building, and you are welcome to take your kids down there at any time to check it out. They will have the best time. We have the best volunteers that are down on either end. Also, if you're new, we would love to connect. So go ahead and grab your phone. It's okay to take it out during service, and you can text the word welcome, and you're going to text it to the number on the screen. It's 763 452 9522. And we'll send you a response. You'll send back your email address. And when we have your email address, we will send you tomorrow in your email a caribou gift card just as a way to say thank you for being here and checking things out. Today's service is going to be great. Pastor Joe is in week two of Didn't See It Coming. He's got some crazy thing to show you with some toilet paper. So that should be fun. And um, also, we're going to learn about Connections International, um, which is one of our missions partners. So let's go ahead and stand and get ready to worship. Darkness, my God. That 
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work in. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper.
trust in you. Oh 
help but thank you this morning and praise you. We have the opportunity to come bow at your feet, to come to the altar, to leave things at your feet. Father, hear our prayers this morning. Hear the hurts, the aches, the pains, and the struggles that we are leaving at your feet. 
We love you and we thank you so much that we have you here to lean on. Amen. You may have a seat as we watch our missions moment. CXI is an organization that serves international students and their families. We have online classes, we have in-person classes, activities that would promote relationship, and many classes that help our students adjust to life in Minnesota. Uh, maybe conversation is the most challenging part of uh, American English. Yeah, you need to uh, talk to a real American. We have volunteer teachers from all over the United States and they're very eager to help internationals. So we touch on grammar, sentence structure, vocabulary, idioms, ways that they can express themselves effectively. Teacher are all nice. They, they don't sit down kind of, because some teacher will be uh, very uh, serious, but uh, the exact teacher is not so serious. Yeah, I improved so quickly. Students value CXI because there are so many opportunities to build friendships. The web of all the teachers, all the students, they build relationships that can last a very long time. I feel like I have a meaningful relationship even in the online classes. My classmate has already uh, became my friend. We'll watch a segment of the video. Many of the students who come have never heard the gospel message or heard that Jesus loves them and what Christianity means. Maybe God is vision. So she's like a vision, me, and I'm curious. I just buy it. <laughs> <laughs> the story from Bible, yeah, it answered me a lot of questions. I started to recognize that the Bible is not only lessons. It also tells people about the nature of, of God. I just wondering why they pray for me. I don't know you and you don't know why you pray for me so kindly. It's just like I am your sister. I, I just cannot understand. I feel the love fill, uh, fill my heart. So I want to know uh, what you believe makes you so lovely makes you so caring. I want to be the person like you. I feel, okay, yeah, there is a God, <laughs> a real God. And that's what gives me such joy as I see the truth of God being revealed by the Holy Spirit in their lives through the teaching of our classes. It's a success of the, the CSI group that through them, a lot of people from many different countries where they never never know about the Bible that they they pose up to, to Jesus. That's pretty cool. We have been partnering with Connections International for over ten years. So t I know that's great, 10 years of connecting with these international students who don't really know English or what life in Minnesota is like, and they build these relationships and then they have the moment to share Jesus with them. Like that is pretty incredible. If you want to learn more about this, you can become one of their tutors. You can just host a student for a holiday dinner. Um, if you want to learn more about these opportunities, you can stop by the table in the commons and talk with Catherine. She'd love to meet you and tell you all about it. Well, let's move into a time of generosity. You can see the ways to give on the screens in front of you. And if you're here in person, we have the secure drop boxes in the back of the room. Who was here last week? We had that, I know, we had the best day of history to celebrate. It was Easter and it was fantastic. And God was amazing that day. I mean, not only do we celebrate the best amazing moment of God in history, but right here, we had the best Sunday ever. We had, are you ready, over 400 kids and youth learning about Jesus that day? 400. I know. Woo! Because we do have a great kids ministry and the best volunteers. Also, throughout that whole morning, I might need a drum roll for this. Ready? Drum roll, everyone. Okay. We had 92 people raise their hands and say yes to Jesus. Yeah. God showed up in a big way. 
So that was amazing. And thank you to each of you for being here, for volunteering, for inviting, and for celebrating with us. It was a great day. Let's go ahead and pray over today. God, I just, um, when I think of last week and how bold your presence was here, I just, I'm so humble and I'm so grateful. And I thank you so much for what you did here through grace. God, that 92 people have their lives forever changed. Thank you for that. And God, too, with um, Connections International, that you're using these people to just build relationships and friendships, and they have a moment to share about who you are. I pray over those volunteers that you continue to make uh, a way for new volunteers and new support um, for these folks to learn about Jesus. And God, I just have to wonder if they bring it back to their own families on the other side of the world and teach them about who you are as well. God, I just pray for the boldness and for the volunteers to come forth to help with that. And God, over our offering today, God, we just give it all back to you. We pray that you would take it and multiply it, that you would use it in any way to build your kingdom. And God, we love you, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Um, here I come again in the need to know. <laughs> Hey Grace friends, I'm Chris Jester. I'm the Connections Director here at Grace and I'm bringing you the need to know. Hey Grace families, have you signed up for VBS yet? It's the best week of summer and it all happens on June 26th through the 29th. This year's theme is Royal Quest and the kids are going to have a week of adventures as they seek out the one true king. You can find all the details and registration on the website under NextGen. This month, Growth Track is being offered in a one-night session on Tuesday, April 18th at 6 p.m. That's three sessions in one night. If you haven't been to Growth Track yet, what are you waiting for? It's a night to learn all about the Grace history and Grace beliefs, also discover your own passions and interests, as well as find your place at Grace. You can RSVP on today's Connect card or go ahead and sign up online. Hey guys, have you heard about Warrior Conference yet? It's a weekend away to inspire your faith. It's happening on May 11th through the 13th. You can sign up online, but check out this video to see what it's all about. Grace's annual celebration is happening on next Sunday, April 23rd. During the services, we'll take a look at the last year and all God's goodness, and we'll look ahead at what's coming up. Then after the second service, you're all invited to stay after for a business meeting. The members will be voting to approve this year's budget. Speaking of the financials, if you have questions over the past year or the upcoming budget, we'd love to invite you to stay today after the 1030 service here in the Worship Center. The elders will be on hand to answer your questions about the finances at Grace. Before I go today, let's fill out today's Connect card. It's a digital Connect card and you can find it in three different ways. You can find it on the Grace app, you can find it on the website, just click on the Sunday Info button, or you can find it by scanning the QR code in front of you. We'd love to know that you're here, help you take next steps, and also know how we can pray for you. That's it for me today. I hope you enjoy today's service and have a great week. Well, welcome to Grace Fellowship. How's everybody doing today? We are so glad that you're with us the week following Easter. My name is Joe Boyd, and I'm the lead pastor here at Grace. And along with a great team, we're helping people to accomplish this vision. And our vision is that we want to help everyone experience grace. And we do that by leading and loving our cities. Well, today we're continuing our series called Didn't See It Coming. And we all have these moments where we didn't see it coming. How many of you would say, that's true in my life? Didn't see it coming. Some of you are looking at some of the things on the stage, and you're like, mm, didn't see that coming. Uh, I don't know what that's what's going on there. Some of you are going, uh, that's two weeks in a row, Joe's not wearing plaid. Didn't see that coming. Uh, some of you are seeing an open umbrella, and you're freaking out because you don't think that's a good idea, but that's okay. You didn't see it coming. Um, last week, after Easter, uh, one of the things we love to do as a family is we like to invite people along uh, to eat uh, dinner with us, and because we were out of town, we, we decided to, um, to go eat out 
which I didn't realize was such a difficult thing to do to find a place that you could actually get a reservation to eat. And so we, we called around to a ton of places and uh, brought some friends and went. And we went to Willie McCoy's just down the, the road. And I just want to say that they were not busy, but they have delicious black and walleye tacos that are awesome. And I didn't see that coming, to be honest. But, but, but what happened was right after we got done, it was time to go home and, and we walked out and it was raining. And I didn't have an umbrella, because I never bring an umbrella, because I, I have trust issues. I don't trust the weatherman, right? And I don't think you do either, but if you're a weatherman, I'm glad you're here. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I just don't think about it. And the thing was, I didn't see it coming. Fast forward this Friday, we went to a different Willie McCoy's in Ramsey to meet up with the grandkids, uh, grand, uh, with our kids' grandparents. And uh, we go in, everything was fine. Had the, had the fish again, excellent. Walked outside and it was raining again. But I was parked way out there and I didn't have an umbrella. Now, the beautiful part is I have a haircut for that occasion. And so I take one for the team and I go get the van and I come back and I pick them all up and, and, and that's the way it goes. The reason why it tends to happen in my life that I don't take the umbrella is because I just didn't see it coming. I didn't think there was a need for it. But here's the challenge. This, my friends, is an umbrella, and, um, and the umbrella um, is actually meant to protect us. You ever thought about that? That the reason why you have an umbrella is because what it does is it protects us from, from the, the rain that's going to come down, the, the light sleet, maybe a little bit of hail. Like, if it's too big, you got to, you know, get out of there. But, but, but it's there for our protection. And when we're under it, great, but when we're not under it, doesn't do any good, does it? And, and, and the thing is, this umbrella, I think, represents a topic that's a challenge for many of us. And the topic is authority. Being under authority. Some of you might say, well, Joe, I don't have a problem with, with authority. My question is, do you, do you follow the speed limit? I mean, listen, man, I'm from, I, I spent time in Texas. I know what the Texas two-step is. It's put both feet on the gas and go five miles over the speed limit. That's what I know, okay? And so I struggle with, with authority issues, and I think that we all struggle with authority issues. But the problem is, is that, that as long as we're under authority, we experience protection, but when we get out from underneath authority, then we're exposed. And God speaks very clearly about this topic. And so today, I, I want to talk about that. But before I do that, I, I do want to address an elephant in the room. Last week, we had a tire hanging. I told a story about uh, a test that was taken. And, um, and of all the things people have asked me about, the number one question is, Joe, you didn't close the loop. What happened to the students? And I will tell you at the end of this message. <laughs> if you're watching online, hang with us, okay? So they're, they're, they're tuning out as we speak. Now, the reason why I, I find that I struggle with, with, with authority is because, to be quite honest, uh, I know me, and I like me, and I think I'm right most of the time. I don't know if you can relate with that, but we make choices based on what we do, based on what I want to do, right? It's like, but I want to. We're all like kids in that way, but I want it, right? That's the first problem. Second problem is, is that we don't see it coming. Like the thing is, if we, if we all had like the crystal ball and we could see it, we would go, oh, okay, I don't really like that rule or that authority, but I will follow it because I know. For instance, how many of you, uh, whenever somebody flashes a light at you or something, slow down because you're like, oh, there's an officer up there, I should follow the speed limit. There's a lot of silence here, man, like, Apparently, I'm the only one. But anyway, um, but, but the, the challenge is, is that, that if, I could, if I had a crystal ball, then I'd follow it. But that's not really following authority. That's just knowing the consequence and avoiding it. But then the third thing is, I think there's a real tension, not between good and evil, as much as it's about versus myself and others. Like, am I going to be a part of something that God's put um, over me? Um, and, 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 and what God does is this incredible thing. Even though we didn't see it coming, God's not surprised. And God puts authority in our lives because he has empathy and authority. 
He empathizes with us because he knows that we live in a world where it's raining out there. When it rains, it pours. Bad things can happen. And he's actually doing it because he loves us. He, he, he got off the boat multiple times in Mark, and what he said every time was, oh, he had compassion for the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He's addressing this authority issue, that they need leadership, they needed authority, they needed somebody to watch out for them, to care for them. So he empathizes that we need leadership in our life and we need protection. But the second thing is, Jesus is the author of authority. Like he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and then he commands us to go and, and, and make disciples in all the world. Do you realize that the word author is in the word authority? Like Jesus establishes authority, which means he paid the cost so he can be the boss. And he's calling us. Listen, he's saying, listen, my kingdom is not Burger King. We can't have it our way. We have to follow him in a very specific way. And so what he does is he gives us this incredible plan. Everybody say the plan. His plan to guide us through this world when it comes to authority is this. And here it is. We have to get under here we go, on the screens. We have to get under what, <laughs> we have to get under the things God put over us. When we do that, we will get over the things that God put under us. Now, what does that mean? That means that God has put us in positions of authority within our families, our relationships, maybe at work, uh, school, different things, different environments. But the thing is, as long as we stand out from underneath the authority of God, all these other things are going to start to go south as well. And so when we get under the things that God put over us, we get over the things that God put under us. Now, if that's going to happen, and we don't just toss authority to the side, God wants us to do three things. Everybody say three things. Three things. Three things. The first thing is we need to understand that blessings is always on the other side of obedience. Blessings are always on the other side of obedience. God wants to bless us, but we need to be on the other side of obedience, which means there needs to be follow through. Today, I want to talk about a very specific person in the Bible. His name is Saul. Uh, Saul was a king, um, and, and he was picked by God's man, Samuel, um, who is a prophet. And, and, and Samuel picked him, and he was the perfect guy. I mean, he looked the part. King Saul was six foot eight. I'm 6'7", depending on the convenience store I'm walking in and out of, so he's tall. Um, he, was, he was fit, he was good looking, right? I'm lacking on that, but okay. Um, but he looked the part. The average Jewish person under his leadership of the day, the men, five, five foot four inches. So he stood head and above. Like they all went, oh, he's the leader, he looks the part. The problem is he looked the part, but he didn't follow under God's authority. And because he didn't follow under God's authority, he didn't experience the blessings that he could have as a king, and he suffered the consequences. And he suffered consequences that he didn't see coming. See, we're all smart enough to know that if we see the consequences coming, we would fall in line. But God wants us to be obedient even when we're unaware of what's going on. I'm going to fast forward and tell you a story about a place where this went down. There's a place called Micmash. Everybody say Micmash. I think we all live a little bit in this place where it's kind of like Micmash, like it's Monday Micmash morning. And, and Micmash was this place where, where these, these enemies, the Philistines of God's chosen people, the Israelites, uh, were kind of at battle. And the Philistines were creeping in on them. They were, they were crowding in on them. How many of you have moments like that? You feel like, man, the world is crowding in. I'm choking out. I don't know what's going to happen. He was under a lot of pressure. Now, the word Micmash actually means something hidden. Now think about that, something hidden. A lot of times, when we don't see God at work, we think God has abandoned us. And just because something's hidden doesn't mean it's not there. You ever, you ever found change or money in the couch cushion before? Just because it's hidden doesn't mean it wasn't there, right? And the same thing's true about God. Now at this place of Micmash, God gave Saul, King Saul, these very specific assignment. You are going to go to war, but before you go to war, you're going to have to wait on my man Samuel, God's chosen man, and when he gets there, the way it worked, um, you're going to offer a sacrifice, but don't offer the sacrifice before my, God, my, my man shows up. 
you got to wait on the Lord. How many of you struggle with waiting? Apparently, not enough hands. People, how many of you struggle with lying? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a challenge. And so, so he's waiting, he's waiting. Um, man, Samuel's not there. Where's Samuel at? Man, we didn't have the Life 360 app back in that day where we can go, where's Samuel at? Is he caught in traffic? What's going on? Where's he at? Where's he at? And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and the Philistines kept creeping in and creeping in. I mean, they got so close, it felt like they were breathing down their necks. And he thought, man, I gotta, I gotta get after this. And so Saul decides, can't wait anymore. I'm going to get after it. And he makes a sacrifice. And, 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 and what happens next is we realize that what he really had was a problem with an umbrella. See, he was for six and a half days under the authority and the protection of God. Even though the enemy was close, never overtook him. But right in that final moment, he got out under the authority and he decided to do it himself. And what happens next is we reveal that he's going to suffer some blessing. What happens is in 1 Samuel 13, verses 11 through 12, Samuel, right after this happens, shows up. You ever have this moment where you disobey and right afterwards you're like, I should have waited? Oh, that's the story of my life. Samuel walks up and says, what have you done? Asked Samuel. Like, have you lost your mind? That's the, I put that in there. That's not in there. But anyway. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgad, and I have not, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So he's, he's playing the blame game. He's like, you didn't show up. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And what he did was he didn't wait. He didn't follow. And what he did was he got out from underneath the authority because he struggled with something that I think many of us struggle with, these three statements, these phrases. I saw, I thought, I felt. Those three phrases will get us in more trouble with God than just about anything else in the world. I saw. We're called to live by faith. I thought. Last week we talked about it. Not my ways, God's ways. I felt. Oh, I felt like it. How many of you made a bad decision and just justified it by saying, I just, I just felt like it? And that sounds real good when you say it. It sounds terrible when your kid says it. Imagine how God feels when he hears it and plays out in motion. Well, see, the thing is, we have that, that problem, and, and, and the reason why we fall into that temptation is because we didn't see it coming. Here, here's just like a free little insight. See, God gives us tests to make us strong, but Satan gives us temptations so that we'll be wrong. And, and there's a difference. Like, we, we have choices when it comes to that. God will test us to make us strong, but Satan will tempt us so we'll be wrong. And the reason why Satan does that is because Satan wants us to be more like him than he does want us to be more like God. He doesn't want us under God's authority because when we step out from underneath the authority of God, we're exposed. We're vulnerable. Bad things can happen, and worst of all, we didn't see it coming. But you know, if you read your Bible, we're not totally blind or unaware that this is the scheme of the devil. In fact, if you look at it, Satan stepped out from under the authority of God. A lot of people don't know this. Satan was actually God's chosen angel. He was like the highest of angels. The problem was he stepped out of authority and God had to cast him out. But look at how it all started. When we go to Isaiah 14, verses 13 through 14, this is Satan talking about his rationale for what he saw, what he thought, and how he felt. And what it says is, he says, I will ascend to heaven. This is, this is Satan, who was God's angel, who now thinks he's bigger and badder than God. He says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne 
above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost highest of the sacred mountain. He's saying, I'm up there, baby. Top of the top. I'm top shelf. But then, <laughs> look at what he says. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You know, the, the place where he went wrong here is he said, I, 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 I will, I will, I will make. And I think that we run a very, very close temptation to do wrong when we think that we can get out from underneath the authority of God and it's going to be okay. That there's no price to pay. And we wonder when we do it all by ourselves, God, do you hate me? Every time I come out of Willie McCoy's, it rains. I have friends in Kansas that are going through a drought. They're like, will you come and walk out of a restaurant for us, please? Some of you are like, Joe, settle down. Do not go to Willie McCoy's today, okay? But, but the thing is, is that when, when, we, when we do this, we, we, we miss the blessing. Saul was called by God, but disobedient and mess, missed the blessings of God, and we're going to see why. Number two, the second thing we got to realize is we got to recognize that partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Like, listen, if we're not 100% on the follow-through, we're missing it. And just remember, we're following and under the authority of a God who went 100% all the way to the cross at Calvary and didn't tap out any point in the way. So he's leading by example. And, and, and when our kids disobey, or they are partially obedient, but then not fully obedient, come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. How many of you, that makes you crazy? You know, you're just like, oh, oh. Well, the same thing went down with Saul again. This time, Saul had a second opportunity to redeem himself. Um, and instead of Michmash, now we're at a place where he's facing off with another enemy. And the enemy were the uh, Amalekite. Amalekite. Amalekites. Can't pronounce it, but they're weird in the Bible. Okay, so. Now, the problem with this group is that they were enemies of God's chosen people. But they, they, they played dirty. They, they waited until after people were leaving, and then they go stab them in the back. That's kind of their, their, their play. And, and God was like, man, I'm done. Done with them. Saul, I need you to take this incredible army that we've assembled that's clearly got God on our side, and I need you to wipe them out completely. Now, we don't like to think about that aspect of God, but the world was so evil at that time that there were times where... God just had to wipe people off the earth. Like, remember, he did flood the earth. So, so God is all about clearing house sometimes because he has the authority to do it. And, and he tells Saul, King Saul, you need to go wipe these people out. And again, he starts out somewhat in the right direction with his own intentions, but he doesn't fully obey. And so Samuel shows up again. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? Um, and um, he hears these, like, goats and, and, and animals in the background. Nah, nah. He's like, what, what is that? And, and who's that over there? And, and he's like, isn't that the king of our enemy? Like, I thought you were supposed to go wipe these people out. I mean, just destroy them. He said, I defeated them. I defeated them. And he thought that was good enough. And the problem was it wasn't. Because in 1 Samuel 15, verse 20 through 21, we, we get the full story. So Samuel is calling out Saul, and he says, didn't, didn't you do this? He said, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the, the, the Amal Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. Now, I just want to say for the record that if there's ever a king name that should have been wiped off the earth. It's Agag. Like Agag, right? Um, he wipes out their soldiers, but he keeps the guy who's in charge. Gag. I mean, it's just ridiculous. 
And, and, and then he says, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgad. Ooh. Now, this is really subtle, okay? So you might sit there and say, well, Joe, he, he wiped out the soldiers. We get that keeping King Agag around was a bad, like, that's not a total wipeout. But what did these sheep and goat ever do? And, and he even said they took it for their plunder, but then we're going we're gonna to sacrifice some of this stuff that we were supposed to destroy to the Lord. And then here's the most subtle part. Look at it. He said, in order to sacrifice them, no, no, let's back up. In order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. See, God was Samuel's God. But the question is, was he really Saul's God? Because Saul had a position, but he wasn't the leader God called him to be. And so what happens is we, we, we find out that God is more concerned with our obedience than sacrifice. In the very next verse, verse 22, it says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Like, think about that in your own lives. Which one does God care about? If he tells us to do something, are we going to do it? Oh, but Lord, I, I gave, I gave, I gave on Sunday. I did my part. Yeah, but I specifically asked you to do this. Why didn't you do it? See, he goes on to say, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. God cares more about our obedience than anything we're ever going to give him. God cares about our obedience incredibly well because partial obedience is still disobedience. And the reason why I think this happens a lot of the time is because most of us are educated above our level of obedience. You know, guys, I, we could do Bible studies and learn all the knowledge in the Bible, but we're no better than Satan. Satan knows every verse in the Bible. God wants us to not only know it, but obey it. And that's the difference between us and Satan. Satan does not obey. God's children obey. And God wants to bless us when we obey. But we've got to be careful. Real quick, poll of the crowd. Um, how many of you, how many of the women, guys too, whatever, whoever, but anybody got a ring ring? It's got some bling bling on it? Anybody got, anybody got a diamond? <laughs> some of you are like looking around like, is he setting me up for something? But, but, but here's the point, right? Diamonds are pretty valuable, aren't they? the ones we buy in the store, the ones that get passed down from generation to generation, right? But they don't all start out pristine, do they? Like if you take a look at this picture, it gives you a progression of what a diamond in the rough looks like, okay? And, and the thing is, that really bright diamond on the end came from that diamond that's real cloudy and just looks like a white rock. And there's a process where there is a cutting away, a removal of parts of that rough diamond that reveal the real value and the clarity of the diamond that we see at the end. The diamond was always there, but it's not worth them as much until parts of it have been removed by a masterful cutter who can see the potential and follow through a process. See, I think a lot of us are diamonds in the rough. God made us, we were there, but through obedience, what God is doing is whacking away parts of our lives that are unnecessary, that are holding back our beauty, holding back our ability to receive and send this incredible reflection and clarity of who God made us to be. And so a lot of that has to do with our obedience. And we can choose to not fall under the obedience or authority of God, and we're going to live in the rough. So, the challenge of that, though, is in 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, it, it, it explains what's going on when we reject the authority of God. When we say, you know what, I know it's there for my protection, but I'm going to choose my rejection. 
For rebellion is like the sins of divination, thinking that we are God, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry, that we think we're above it. And, and, and on various levels, we all reject authority, and in essence, we're rejecting what God calls us to. The third, everybody say third. The third thing we learn with this plan to get under what God puts over us so that we can get over what God put under us is this, realize that dismissing God-given authority is missing God-given opportunity. Sometimes God puts us under authority, puts us under leaders, puts us under people that drive us cray-cray. Okay, I'm not gonna ask for any show of hands here, but let's be honest. How many of us have been under somebody and you're like, I don't understand the decisions they're making, this seems dumb, you know, this is ridiculous. Some of you are like almost raising your hand and like, yep, my boss is here, but anyway. To dismiss God-given authority is, to, is missing God-given opportunity. Sometimes God puts us on authority because he's setting us up for something later. The, the first example that I see in this is um, that Saul has disobeyed God twice. And now God's going to move on and replace him with another king. And the king is David. And, and David is this young leader that was overlooked, and, and even Samuel overlooked him. He was the eighth person he thought about in Jesse's family before he realized that's who God was calling. And, and Saul didn't like that. He was insecure, and so he wanted to kill David. He's like, if I can just kill my opposition, God will have to keep me in position and power. That's ridiculous, but he did it anyway. So David and his military leaders, kind of his Green Berets, his, his Delta Force, they were hiding in this cave because, because Saul was out to kill him. And the Bible tells us that Saul came into the cave by himself. He left his army outside. He went in the cave. And he went in the cave, and I just can't say it any other way. He went in there to relieve himself. Went to the bathroom. By the way, I'm not saying anything wrong. It's in the Bible, okay? Read it. It's there. So he's over there, you know, thinking. (laughs) And stinking. Yeah, it's stinking thinking. That's what he did. But anyway... He's there, and he doesn't realize that David and his military leaders are right there. And, and, and this is no joke. David sneaks up on him, and, and, and his, his team wanted him to take him out, and he could have. I mean, he was sitting there. He was going to put a hit on him, right? But he doesn't. He, he just cuts away a little corner of his clothing. And then Saul gets up, finishes his business, gets off the throne, so to speak, goes back out to the troops, David calls out, and he's like, could have killed you, but I didn't. I got the proof. Here's the edge of your garment. He had a receipt <laughs> of a hit that he didn't take. That happened in a cave. Now we fast forward. Oh, and by the way, you might say, well, David was so young. See, a lot of times we think maturity comes with age. That's not really true. Here's the thing. The Bible tells us maturity is developed better through obedience than time. You can be young and obedient and instantly mature. You can be old and be disobedient and be way off the blocks. Like, people do this all the time. Well, at least I'm consistent. Listen, a broken clock's right two times a day. Over a long enough period of time, you can claim a lot of, you know, being right, but it's still broken. And David was more mature than Saul. Fast forward, now they're camping. Saul's out there, he's camping, He's in the wide open. He has no protection. And this time, the Delta Force, David's guys, they're like, dude, we can totally take him. Take him out. He's asleep. This is it. And David doesn't do it. His team is like, bro, that makes no sense. We don't even understand it. And look at what he says in 1 Samuel 26, 9 through 11. Don't destroy him. See, David wasn't going to do it, and then David stopped his own men from doing it. For who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be blameless? He's like, listen, Saul, Saul is cray-cray, but he's still God's man. He's the king. And, and, and you can't lift your hand against God and be blameless. David added, as the Lord lives, the Lord will certainly strike him down. Either his day will come or he will die or he will go into battle and perish. And he's saying, listen, it's up to God. But however, because of the Lord, I will never lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. 
And what we find in this moment is that David, at that time in his life, was a man who had a heart after God and a person who was obedient. We, we find out later that his disobedience cost him too. But the principle's the same. We're called to follow authority. And we all have a choice to be over or under authority. We all have a choice. Here's, here's the consequence, though. Romans 13, 2 tells us this. He who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So if you go out with an, without an umbrella and it rains, you shouldn't be surprised that you got wet. But the second thing is there's a, there's a benefit to being under God's authority. And it's this. It says we are witnesses of these things, Acts 5.32 and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. See, I think that the reason why we struggle with authority is that we haven't seen the power of God. We haven't suffered the consequences of the power of God. And so we tend to think that, that we have all the power. And I got a little leaf blower here this morning. It's got a little power to it. And, and, and I have this paint roller that has toilet paper on it. And um, got thinking about that. Um, the thing is, when we're over the authority of God, not much happens. But when we get under the authority of God, oh, now we got it going. Woo! And the Holy Spirit's like the wind. We don't see it coming. And God promises that he gives power to those who obey. The reason why we walk around powerless as Christians oftentimes is not the fact that we aren't children of God, it's that we disobey God. And we miss the potential. Today, I think it's important for us to ask the question of application. What authority do we need to obey in our life? I want us to think about it for a minute. Maybe some of us need to leave here today and actually follow the speed limit. You know, you're never going to get a ticket for a speed you don't exceed. But for some of us, maybe we need to be more obedient to our parents and actually cl clean your whole room. Amen. Right? Some of us, we need to be obedient to the leaders and teachers and people that have authority in our lives. Maybe we, we need to be obedient to the Word of God. You know, we need to learn to be good followers and actually obey and follow Jesus and follow the people that Jesus puts over our life. Maybe God's calling us to obey and actually serve other people because we didn't, he didn't come to be served but to serve others. Maybe God's calling us to give, put God first in our finances. I, I don't know what the authority issue is, but the question is, is there an authority issue you need to be under? Is there an authority that God's placed that we need to be there? And I want you to know that authority is not there for our punishment, it's for our protection. It protects us from things. And, and we learned last week that God protected us from the consequences of sin because we were under the blood of Christ. And do you know that when we talk about helping everyone experience grace, here's why it's so important. Grace is entirely based on the obedience of Jesus. If Jesus wasn't fully obedient, we would have no grace to share with anyone. Because we can't give what we don't have, and Jesus gave everything he had. It says in Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, remember, Adam and Eve disobeyed, we fell into sin, the whole world was upside down. It says, from one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Because Jesus was obedient, we are forgiven. I heard this quote this week, and it's not in the notes, but it's really powerful. Think about this. The remarkable part of Christianity is not that we're under a Savior who came to deliver us, but that we have a Savior who sees us for who we really are and loves us anyway. Think about that. What Jesus does is Jesus offers us protection and provision. And there's a progression through John 14, 14 through 16, I think we need to look at. 
Jesus says this, you may, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now think about that. You're like, I can ask Jesus for anything? Well, anything in his name, anything he already wants to give us. That's, if, if we're under the authority of God and we ask for things he already wants to bless us with, he's gonna hook it up. Now if we're like, Jesus, I really need the lotto. Eh. But, but that's the first thing. But here's the second thing. We have to choose to remain under the authority. Verse 15, look at what it says. If you love me, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, let me protect you. Trust me. That's what he's really saying, trust me. And then the third thing is verse 16. It says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And that, my friends, is how we don't get caught in the rain or how we get caught without the protection and provision of God by being under the authority that he put us under so we can be over what he put, us, what he put under us. Today, I want to invite each and every one of us to, to really ask yourself, are we really under the authority of God? Today, you might have come here and you might say, well, Joe, I, I don't even know why I came. You know, somebody invited me. Why are we talking about authority? We're talking about authority because God wants us to get under his protection. And if we're walking around without the covering of God, we're vulnerable. And we don't want something from you, we want something for you. And so I want to invite you, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, today, let today be the day. And experience the power that will give you a lift like never before. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, in this moment, I pray that you move me out of the way and that you speak so clearly to each and every one of us. God, we love you so much. We, we understand that when we're under your authority, we have protection, but when we're out from under your authority, that is actually sinful. It is disobedience. And partial obedience is not complete obedience. And blessing is always on the other side of obedience. And so God, today, if there's anyone who would say, I need to be under the authority, under the blood, under the the protection of Jesus. Let today be the day that you choose to get under his authority and be blessed for eternity. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you'd say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner, I need you, I trust you, I will follow you. At the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and raise it high. Here we go. One, two, three. If that's you, just raise your hand. Praise God. I see your hand, young lady. Praise God all over the place, online. Praise God for people that are saying yes. In your name we pray. Jesus Christ all the way. Amen. All right, guys. I want you to pull out your cell phones real quick, and we're going to take some steps together. Um, I want you to shoot the QR code, whether you're uh, online or maybe on the back of your seat. You can uh, get it on the screen. But earlier we asked you to fill out the Connect card. Let us know your name. Let us know how we can pray for you. But I want to encourage you to take some steps. Uh, choose to serve. Maybe God's calling you to serve. Maybe God's calling you to give. Maybe God's calling you to take a step. But, but whatever it is, take that step and be under that authority. Two, if you said yes to Jesus today, I'm going to ask that you would text the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, to 763-452-9522. You could also, if you're here in person, you could uh, check that on the Connect card. And so we want to encourage you to do that. And then lastly, I want to invite you to take a next step and attend our growth track that's on Tuesday night, April 18th. It's coming up. It's a one and done night, great night. It's an opportunity for you to discover our vision, our mission, our purpose, our leadership structure, uh, because God calls us to be the church and be part of a church. And we want you to understand the authority and the leadership and the vision and the direction we're going so that we can walk together in this and go further than God ever imagined. I want to encourage you to take that step. Join us in that. Join so many others that are joining our church right now and be a part of what God's doing. Guys, we love you. We'll see you next week as we continue the series. And next week, I'm going to do one of the most expensive uh, illustrations you've ever seen. It's going to involve eggs. We'll see you next week. God bless. Oh! See how that works? You guys expect me to be responsible and obedient. So here's the answer. They all got A's. It turns out they told the truth, front right tire. God bless you. See you next week. <laughs>